Good evening. Welcome. Welcome both to our attendees physically here in the room at the Royal Society. A warm welcome to our first speaker. There we are. We have fingertip control. Brilliant. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, and uh, welcome also to our online participants. And uh, our online participants will be able to join in the Q&A on Slido. Uh, and for our people physically in the room, you have an option. If you want to use your mobile and start engaging via Slido, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and alternatively, uh, and so for Slido, the code, I should read this out, is hash 9578078. Nine five seven eight zero seven eight. But equally, I will also be looking at people raise their hands as well in the old-fashioned physical way. And if you are speaking physically, remember to unmute as well. Um, so now let's turn to our discussion of nuclear. It's great that we've got a panel of four formidable experts on new on new nuclear and the UK energy strategy following on from the April 2022 publication by the government of its energy strategy, which envisages raising nuclear generating capacity to 24 gigawatts by 2050. Uh, I was uh, over the weekend at a conference uh, in America with uh, French experts who are very proud of the day in 1975 when President Pompidou in the morning, decided to invest in train grande vitesse, and in the afternoon, decided to invest in a network of civil nuclear reactors. That is a good day's work at the <laughs> office. That's what it looks like. And of course, that is what Boris dreams of. That is the type of prime minister Boris would love to be. Anyway, we're now going to see what the chances are of actually delivering an increase in uh, expansion of new nuclear power. Our first speaker, Julia Pike is Director of Financing for Sizewell C, so she is engaging in identifying inventive ways of financing Sizewell C. Before that, she was Head of Power and Renewables for UK, US, and Europe at Herbert Smith, and she's a Fellow of the Energy Institute. Julia, thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks very much. So, um, I started advising Hinkley in 2006 at Herbert Smith, and although people talk about is Hinkley late, the answer is that um, it wasn't allowed to start building until 2016. So when people talk about um, Van Sondra Rivas's ill-fated remark that be cooking our Christmas turkeys in 2017, <coughs> I think it would have been some pretty raw turkey, given that the oven didn't get turned on till 2016. So the build at Hinkley is actually going very well. Um, for a UK mega project, it's a huge success story. It's um, running probably only about six months behind schedule, other than um, the intervention of COVID, which, as with everybody, COVID has impacted progress at Hinkley through their having much lower numbers and through impacting the factories making the kit. But Hinkley is... Um, although seldom reported this way, actually a huge success story for, and it's a particular success story because it's a first of a kind nuclear reactor in a generation in the UK. But when we talk about what's the future of nuclear in the UK's energy system, we have to recognize that the future of the energy system is going to be predominantly intermittent and predominantly provided by renewables. So Hinkley could be physically flexible but the contract for difference makes it economically inflexible. It's going to get £92.50 if it puts electricity onto the national grid, and if it were, for example, to divert electricity to hydrogen electrolysis, which might be what the system needs from time to time in the future, it's not going to get paid £92.50. So it's economically inflexible. So when we started looking at Sizewell, and we, we started by looking at what the appetite was for more gigawatt nuclear, so one set of issues is, can we make a success of gigawatt nuclear in the UK? You won't be surprised to hear that I think the answer to that is yes. And we'll come on to that in a minute. But we had to look at it much more broadly than that. What's the appetite for more gigawatt nuclear, for more base load power, and then increasing the intermittent system? So one of the primary things that we did in thinking about Sizewell is to make it economically flexible. And it's economic flexibility 
allied to physical flexibility, has led us to an availability payment. So I've all been paid to be available. It won't be paid for putting megawatt hours onto the grid. So it will put megawatt hours onto the grid, if that's what the system wants in, 10, in 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years time. Or it will be configured so that it can put its electricity into non-grid uses. So it will it's be able to send its electricity to, for example, hydrogen electrolysis, which it could co-power with renewables. And that's good for everybody because it's good for electrolyzer life cycles. It's good for making sure that you've got something going into the electrolyzer when it's not windy. It's good for everybody. It, it gives something to do with the power when the national grid doesn't want to take that quantity of power from Sizewell. And then the thing that we've done additionally is to make sure that we've remembered that nuclear is a huge heat machine. So nuclear is a huge heat machine from, from which we have habitually in the UK made grid-scale electricity. That's not what people have done with nuclear in countries which have valued heat more highly. So in Finland, in Sweden, in Russia, in China, nuclear is used for district heating. So for Sizewell, we are putting in valves to take out steam at around 270 degrees before it hits the turbine. And we can take out around about 400 megawatt thermal without significantly impacting electrical output. So that heat is cheap. Obviously, there's the cost of putting in the valves, the cost of taking the heat to where we need the heat. But, but it, it, in a world in which um, cheap low carbon heat is at a premium, we can provide a very useful service. So I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist. Um, so you know you can um, don't don't direct to me your challenges around. Am I absolutely sure there'll be absolutely no impact on electrical output? So I'm reliably informed that, that will be the case. You say what can you do with 400 megawatt thermal heat at 270 degrees? So we are looking at a variety of things. Um, we are looking at heat-assisted electrolysis for hydrogen to make it cheaper. So Suffolk is an absolutely brilliant place to make a lot of hydrogen. In the Sizewell Beach, um, such as our electricity system, we are likely to end up with around about a third of the UK's power coming in onto that beach. If there's you know, a good place to make, to make hydrogen, it's there. It's close to Felixstowe and to Harwich. Sizewell Sea is actually part of the Felixstowe Freeport East initiative, um, precisely because we'll be able to provide clean heat and power and hydrogen. And actually, ports, as it happens, have one of the first use cases for hydrogen at scale because port vehicles exist in a hydrogen driven form. We are also looking at heat powered desalination. Suffolk's incredibly arid. Last year, the um, East Suffolk region where Sizewell is located reduced the water abstraction licenses by 30%. This is a huge issue for farmers. If we have heat with which we can um, do economic desalination, we should do it. And then we are funded by Bayes to um, develop a novel heat-powered direct air capture prototype. And this prototype is developed with Nottingham University, with Strata, and with Babcock. So it's, it's a UK-developed prototype. And um, the, the idea of our, of our nuclear heat-powered direct air capture prototype is that it will roughly halve the cost which Climeworks is currently charging for electrically-powered direct air capture because it's heat convection and it uses almost no electricity. <coughs> and our 400 megawatt thermal of heat is cheap. So those are all very exciting ideas around how can we help Sizewell fit into the flexible future. And as well as sort of the moral imperative to make the use, the most use you can of a large asset, which is going to have an, an operating life of at least 60 years, in reality probably 80, um, it's also much more attractive to people who are looking at investing. You know, the financial community um, has never invested in Project Nuclear. We're very confident that they will. At the moment, I'm in the middle of leading a process to get an indicative rating, so we, we expect to get an indicative investment grade rating for the debt, which means we'll be able to raise the um, vast quantities to of the order of 20 billion pounds of debt that we'll need, and um, we're confident that we'll be able to raise the equity. However, it is the first time. And having the opportunity to get in at the start on technologies like um, heat-assisted hydrogen and light direct air capture, and possibly being able to be part of the future in which new housing is district heated, um, is very exciting for people. And it's, it, and, and it's actually more attractive to a lot of people in the investment community than the nuclear itself. Although, obviously, 
nuclear itself is the main point of what we're doing. So if I turn to just a couple of other themes briefly, Hinkley has two units and it's going well and unit two is going better than unit one as you would imagine because like all humans, humans building nuclear power stations do it better the second time. And we are intending that Sizewell is effectively Hinkley units three and four. And to achieve this, we have done the following things. We have insisted that the design is replicated. So except insofar as we have to change um, the uh, marine works because it's a different sea level, it's a different marine environment, and we have a, slight, we have a differently shaped plot plan, so we have a slightly differently shaped dry fuel store, um, it is an exact replication. We have a no change committee. If any engineers bring forward optimization, saying if only we change this, this would be a bit better. There are, they are repressed. Um, <laughs> so, so we, can't, we can't afford change. And we have also agreed with the government that we're going to use the Hinkley supply chain. If people talk about nuclear as though it's all built by the developer, it's all built by Hinkley, it's all built by Sizewell, of course it isn't. That's a layer on top of a 8,000 person supply chain. And so it's absolutely critical that we are able to reuse the Hinkley supply chain because guess what? Just as we have learnt, so have they. And so um, Bayes has agreed that we are able to use the same supply chain. And I'm delighted to tell you that I think 90% of the supply of the content of Sizewell will be UK through life, which is a very impressive figure. Um, so we are very much hoping to get our development consent order on the 8th of July. We are um, delighted to see that the government yesterday published the designation criteria under the regulated asset-based model, which I'll turn to briefly in a moment as to what it is, why am I talking about it. Um, but it means that we are, um, we, that it means that the government has published subject to consultation it regards Sizewell as value for money and is inclined to award it a regulated asset-based license. And we um, today have seen the Secretary of State announce that, that the government will take a special share in all future nuclear so that we don't have security concerns around who is able to come in and own nuclear power stations. And personally, I think that's an excellent move and um, something I very fully support. So why the regulated asset-based model? So, uh, as, as, well as, as well as the Christmas turkeys, why couldn't you build it in the one year you were given after the government gave you the go-ahead that gets thrown at Hinkley? We also have the, isn't it ludicrously expensive, £92.50, um, at a point where um, today offshore wind is, can be more like 50. So what are we doing? What's nuclear for? Is it the same as offshore wind? Is it apples for apples? It's not apples for apples. What are you buying when you buy a nuclear power station? What you're buying is you're buying energy security. So we're very much hoping to have, well, we, we have committed to have the fuel made in the UK, and we're very much hoping to be able to explore the, the re-enrichment of existing UK uranium stocks, which would give us, in operation, a 100% UK um, supply chain and energy security. And you are obviously buying um, electricity, which is not weather dependent and you're buying a machine which is able to, to maximize its output of heat if you can make the safety case to take out more than 400 megawatt thermal so that's a task it's a task we haven't yet started to undertake but 400 megawatt thermal is a lot 400 megawatt thermal through our with our direct air capture technology would offset all of today's rail industry emissions so 400 megawatt thermal pretty much free is a very good thing um, and uh, so, so, yes, what, what are, what, why, why is nuclear then expensive? If we, if we think it is expensive, if we think that what we're buying is exactly equivalent to wind. First of all, it isn't exactly equivalent to wind. It's doing a different job. It's doing a different job in the system. Second of all, why was it £92.50? So £92.50, so if 11 to £13 is the actual cost of construction, £20 is the cost of operation, including fuel and including decommissioning. What's the rest of the money for? The rest of the money is because, as I said, I started advising on this in 2006, and the contract for difference model won't pay EDF a penny until the station turns on in 2027. So that's one hell of a credit card bill if you roll it up for all of that time. 21 years of interest on considerable quantities of money that EDF is spending in the UK on this power station, which in, in itself has, I think, 70% UK content. So it's heavily UK dominated. 
And that, that, that cost of money is made up of two things. It's made up of all of that rolled up interest, and it's made up of the cost of capital if you require the developer to take all risks, including risks which are effectively imposed upon you by government or are the risks of a pandemic or are the risks of Brexit. You think it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, but it certainly had an impact. Um, all of those risks sit with EDF. So in looking at Sizewell, there's an imperative to make Sizewell cheaper. You make Sizewell cheaper in two ways. First of all, you reduce the capital cost. You reduce that by not doing the design again. We're not doing the design again by using the same supply chain, so the supply chain doesn't have to do what's called qualify. If you want to supply safety-critical equipment into a nuclear power station, you go through a very lengthy process to prove that your equipment can perform under high-stress circumstances and prove to the ONR that you are a fit supplier. It's a high cost to qualifying your equipment, so you don't have to do that again. So that's all the saving, and obviously we'll do it better because this will be the third <coughs> time we've built the exact same design. And so the capital cost will be lower, but the, but the vast majority of the cost is the cost of the money. So the cost of the money will be lower in a regulated asset-based model for the following reasons. First of all, you don't roll up interest. So as for any asset built under a regulated asset base, so that's the whole of our electricity transmission system, it's all of our water industry, it's our airports, it's very common, it's, it's, how, most, it's, it's how many critical infrastructure are provided. It was put in place basically at privatisation in order to induce the private sector to come into critical infrastructure. Um, so you don't roll up interest. The um, lenders will be paid interest on their debt through construction and the equity will receive a small return through construction. And those things, for size well, will amount to an, to an amount which is between pence and uh, pence per household per year and round about one pound per household per month at the height of construction. When Sizewell turns on, it will save households in itself, in our modelling, um, which uses the Bayes model and the Bayes assumptions, it will save it sort of somewhere between 30 to 50 pounds per household per year, because an electricity system with the right amount of nuclear in it, which is a renewables dominated system with the right amount of nuclear, um, is a cheaper system. So far from being expensive, it's expensive as a unit item, because you're building 7% of the nation's electricity in two fields. It's expensive to do that, but your household bills will go down. This is a very little understood phenomenon. <laughs> and, um, I think I've probably talked for long enough. All in all, I'd say it's a, you know, size is going to be good. It's going to be British. It's going to be owned, we hope, predominantly by British pension <coughs> funds, um, partly by the British government. EDF is only going to retain a 20% stake. So we can look at this in many ways as being the effective renationalisation of what was the British energy capability privatised in, I think, the uh, early 90s. And I very much look forward, hopefully, to development consent order in on the 8th of July and starting to build. Very good. Thank you very much, Julia. Let's uh, go straight on to our second speaker, Sophie McFarlane-Smith. She's Head of Customer Engagement for Rolls-Royce SMR. She joined the reactor physics team of Rolls-Royce in 1996. She's worked on multiple sectors, including submarines. And welcome. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to you all. Um, the first thing I should probably say is, even though I have a background in submarine reactors, I can tell you a civil nuclear reactor is very, very different from a submarine reactor. So what we are not doing in Rolls-Royce SMR is taking a submarine reactor and putting it on land. That would be a bit of a silly thing to do, <coughs> both economically and practically. Um, so I, have, I do have a few slides, uh, but I will just go through very quickly. Um, so I, what I want to talk about this afternoon is how Rolls-Royce SMR are contributing to the energy security, um, the energy security strategy and the net zero strategy for the UK, but not just for the UK, but also the rest of the world as well. And as we've talked about, my name is Sophie McFarlane-Smith. I'm in Rolls-Royce SMR Limited. Now, first of all, for anyone out there who's wondering why on earth a car manufacturer is getting involved in making nuclear power stations, um, first of all, sadly, it's been quite a few years since Rolls-Royce made cars. Um, and secondly, for those who don't know, Rolls-Royce has been involved in designing and manufacturing and operating small nuclear plants for over 60 years for the, the UK submarine programme. 
So we have significant experience in manufacturing reactors. If you go to Derby, we have uh, several manufacturing plants. We have test facilities um, that we run in the country. And we have taken that expertise, that knowledge of how to uh, design uh, and operate nuclear, small nuclear plants, and now translated that into the civil world. But we're not alone. Um, as you can see there, Rolls-Royce is the majority shareholder in the Rolls-Royce uh, uh, SMR Limited company, but we do have other shareholders. So we have Constellation Energy, who were uh, previously known as Exelon, um, the uh, US uh, energy utility company. They run the majority, uh, have a, a very significant fleet of nuclear plant that they operate in the US. And we also have BNF Resources, and the Qatar Investment Authority as our shareholders. So again, just a quick overview of why on earth is Rolls-Royce uh, doing civil reactors. Now, what I'm not going to talk about is why we need nuclear reactors, because I think hopefully most people in, in the room are aware that the world, the UK and the world, has a very significant challenge with respect to decarbonisation. Uh, and most solutions for decarbonisation, whether it's for electricity, just, uh, heating or transport, most solutions that we currently have in place need electricity and they need lots and lots of electricity at vast scale. Um, and therefore, we understand, hopefully, again, I hope you'll agree with me, that nuclear power can generate vast quantities of low carbon power very efficiently. And therefore, the question is not, do we need nuclear power as part of our solution, but actually, how do we get more of it as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible, and has as affordably as possible. And that is the challenge that we face in the world today. How can we roll out this technology that we know is good, that Julia's talked about, is already uh, working in operation in the UK and around the world for decades. How can we get more of it as fast as possible? And this is what Rolls-Royce SMR is doing. So Rolls-Royce, is looking at a new way of bringing nuclear power to the market. And we believe the best way to achieve this is to use proven nuclear technology, proven pressurized water reactor technology that's in operation today around the world, but delivering it in a different way, delivering it as a standard, standardized manufactured product, turning it into a commodity uh, from a, a one-off infrastructure project. And the UK and Rolls-Royce SMR is doing just that. We're turning nuclear power from a, a mega infrastructure project into a manufactured commodity. And how are we doing that? Well, for one thing, we're looking at not just the nuclear island. So we are not a traditional technology vendor. We are actually delivering the complete power station um, rather than just the nuclear island. Um, and we are delivering it in a modularized way. So just to talk about this modularization approach, we're taking the whole of the power station that you can see up there and chunking it into different uh, modules, around 1,600 modules, if you can imagine the whole power station chunked up into what we would, might call Lego bricks. That's exactly what we're doing. And each of, these, each of these modules has a different function, and each of these modules is road transportable. So what we're doing is we're making sure how can we manufacture this in a repeatable way? How can we deliver this in the simplest, most cost-effective way possible, i.e. through roads, so we don't need to build new infrastructure uh, where we're going to build the plant? And then how can we assemble this in the most cost-efficient way? And again, just some pictures, because I don't want to dwell on this particularly, but what we're talking about is setting up new facilities, manufacturing facilities, to manufacture these uh, different modules that we have, and then all of these modules will be transported to our site assembly factory, which is covered, so we're protected from the weather, and then we can actually build our modules, assemble our modules into the overall power station on site. So again, this is taking proven technology, but delivering it in a new way that actually means that be it becomes um, economically viable. And again, just some more examples of some of the types of modules that we have. And what's it for? Uh, Julia described very well what nuclear is for. It's for electricity, but it's not just for electricity. Um, a lot of the world's decarbonisation needs more than just electricity. We're talking about making different types of fuels, 
for um, uh, synthetic aviation fuel, which, as you would imagine, for aircraft is something that Rolls-Royce is very interested in. So we need vast quantities of synthetic fuels for the aircraft industry, also for the marine industry. We need hydrogen for all sorts of different applications. Um, we're looking at district uh, heating and cooling. We talked about direct air capture. So there are so many different uses for this type of low carbon power and the heat and the electricity that nuclear can produce. Um, and actually, um, there are many, many customers that are looking at this power. So when we talk about grid electricity, obviously the government and, and, and the national infrastructure is really important, but there are huge numbers of industries that are looking for solutions to decarbonize their industrial uh, 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 landscape. And actually, most of those are looking at heat or electricity needs. Um, and they have done the maths for themselves, and they've realized that actually they can only go so far with wind and solar. So actually, um, they've come to the conclusion if they really want to decarbonize their sector, they're going to have to go nuclear. And now they're looking at, well, how can we do that? And that's where SMRs in particular can step in. Um, because SMRs being smaller in size um, and lower power output and more flexibly, it can be more flexibly placed. So they can actually go where place, in places where large nuclear can't go at the moment. Um, and they can support uh, more industrial sectors to decarbonize, or they can be used very much to replace existing coal or gas infrastructure. So actually, they can be used for uh, a, a complete variety of things. So what are the challenges? So today we're here talking about the challenges of, of, um, of nuclear and going for nuclear. And again, this, we aren't complacent about what we're trying to do. But, but the challenges are not around licensing. So everyone talks about, oh, nuclear is difficult to license. Actually, if you make a design decision to use standard technology, pressurized water reactor technology that almost every regulator in the world knows and understands and already uses, and if you make the decision to use standard fuel, actually your licensing risk is particularly low. And obviously we're very fortunate in the UK as a UK company with experience of designing nuclear plant in the UK, we understand the UK regulatory regime very well. But we're not just designing this plant for the UK, we're designing it for the world. But licensing is not particularly a risk. Manufacturing, would you, is manufacturing a risk? Well, not really to Rolls-Royce. We've had 60 odd years of making nuclear plants for the submarines program, and we've had over 100 years of manufacturing complex products for industry, not just in the UK and around the world. So manufacturing is not really what we would consider a risk. And construction, again, construction is not what we would consider a risk, or assembly as we call it in our process. So we're not thinking of assembly as a problem. Um, we understand that the plant is actually designed for ease of assembly. Um, and also, we're using assembly techniques that our construction partners use readily today in other sectors. So we're not inventing something new. We're taking technology that's used in other sectors and bringing it to the nuclear sector. And also, for us, the challenge is not really financial as well. So again, two billion for a power station is obviously an awful lot of money, but actually, it's a value that is investable, uh, we believe is investable on the open market. Um, on the standard market, and we uh, uh, and because we have delivery certainty, again, it makes it a more uh, attractive prospect for either financial investors or for companies and industries who are looking for a solution to their power needs. So money is not uh, not necessarily the uh, challenge that we have. So what do we see as the challenges coming for us? Sites, sites. The UK has designated a certain number of sites uh, for nuclear at the moment. Great. Can we please know which ones we're going to be allocated, same as other, other nuclear technologies that want to build new sites? We need to know very quickly which sites that we can use so we can get on and develop those projects. We also need more sites. Uh, and this is not just an issue in the UK. Of course, we want to build on the sites that exist at the moment, but our pers prospective customers the uh, usually industrial customers, actually, they want SMRs near to their own facilities. They want more sites to be allocated. So we need lots more sites to be allocated. The other thing we need is faster site permitting. So again, even though you have a site and you've been through your generic licensing, obviously you need to go through your um, site-specific licensing and your site permitting. And, and we all know, and, and poor Julia knows this better than any of us, I think, how long that process takes. Eight, yes, 
If we can manufacture two or four plants per year in our facilities, but then we have to have them sat waiting before we can actually build, then we completely destroy the economics of the manufacturing approach. So if we really want to speed this up, we need to understand how to do site permitting as fast as we can manufacture. And we're not talking about cutting corners, because in the manufacturing process you don't cut corners, because then you wouldn't have a product that works. What you do is you find the most efficient way to get the result that you need. So collectively as an industry, it's one of the things with government that we're all looking at in terms of how we um, can move forward with site permitting. And then the final challenge that we have, and that this may be sound strange, uh, given that we haven't actually built our first plant yet, but our real concern is scale. The demand that we see from within the UK and outside the UK in terms of the export markets, specifically to support decarbonisation and the energy security needs uh, around the world, is vast. And we have significant interest in near-term deployment, not just in the UK and outside. So the question for us is how fast can we scale up our manufacturing facilities to be able to deliver and support um, the demand that we see coming in. And that's something we're already starting to tackle even as we set up our first facilities, is how do we manage the growth um, that we see in this market? So hopefully I've given you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing and the challenges we face, and I look forward to answering, answering any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Our next speaker is John Cordroy. He's the GDF Technical Director for Nuclear Waste Services, the delivery body for the UK's Deep Geological Disposal Facility, and uh, he has a key responsibility uh, for the final disposal of the nation's stockpile of high-level radioactive waste. John, over to you. Well, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about um, the GDF program. Um, I've been with the program about six years now, although it's been around in various guises um, since the 80s in the form of NIREX. NDA owned it for a while. My previous company, Radioactive Waste Management, um, as of early this year, we formed up with another NDA subsidiary, and we're now Nuclear Waste Services, um, and we're committed to uh, working this program that was first pointed at uh, in 1976 by uh, Sir Brian Flowers in the Flowers Commission on the Environment. Um, so it's something for the nuclear industry to really think about why someone with the foresight in 1976 pointing at a program that needs to be delivered and we're still here in 2022 uh, making good progress on the sites but only recently have we stepped into that domain. Um, so uh, a, a lot of the context there, you know, the, the waste that we have in the UK comes from a whole variety of activity that you know, traces back since uh, the, the 1940s we started generating waste. We have, um, you know, if there was a gold medal for the stockpile of radioactive waste, um, we'd be kind of probably on the top of the podium, um, and not least because we've dabbled in everything as a nation. So it's not only the scale of our inventory, it's its complexity, and everything in the inventory needs a solution. So we've got a pretty big challenge uh, of disposing of it. Um, we've got waste. Uh, stored all over the country, as you can see there. Um, not an immediate problem now, but it's not fair. And what I mean by that is imagine if every year a chunk of your tax was for you to store and look after something that was generated 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Absolutely no use to you, not doing anything, but you're still paying for it. So the purpose of disposing of the waste as opposed to storing the waste is to address this intergenerational equity, uh, you know, bring back a bit of intergenerational fairness. We shouldn't expect future generations to carry on paying to store the waste that was generated uh, a long time ago and will be generated now. Um, we've been through various uh, ranges of uh, sort of policy uh, work on, on geological disposal. Um, the, the policy that we run on now um, was launched in 2018. It came about from a very thorough look at the previous process that closed down in 2013. Um, communities are at the heart of it. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we're in a, a voluntary, uh, consent-based world. Uh, we're looking for communities who can look beyond 
the immediate tissue rejection of why would I want radioactive waste in my environment uh, to people who start to see the benefits that the program will bring. Jobs, investment, uh, long-term economic activity, uh, very sort of steady enterprise uh, for the right community to take on. Um, just to make sure we all know roughly what I'm talking about in terms of a, a geological disposal facility, this waste that stays active and dangerous for thousands of years, you know, uh, some of it up to hundreds of thousands of years, um, the, the deep geological barriers somewhere in the region uh, up to 1,000 metres deep provide the adequate uh, you know, control of that waste and we can put it uh, in a facility. So at the, the right-hand side of the screen there, we're talking an area five by five, six by six kilometres, about 1,000 metres beneath the seabed um, engineered bolts and tunnels, that's where the waste goes. Surface facilities, you know, nothing too dramatic, not heavy industrial use, about a square kilometre. Uh, the waste is packaged uh, to be passively safe in other facilities, you know, such as Sellafield. Um, so this is a logistics facility, bringing in waste from around the country, moving it to depth, putting it into the right vaults and tunnels, and then eventually, after a very long period of operations, over 100 years, uh, the facility is sealed up. Um, but that's, the, in essence, that's what a deep geological repository is all about. Um, uh, Policy is working well for us now. Um, we've probably got the most vibrant process going that we've had for some time. Um, you know, this was built on the back of looking internationally uh, at what was working elsewhere. Um, you know, NIREX days was a, you know, decide, announce, defend type policy. Uh, the, uh, the the 28, uh, 2008 to 2013 policy was very rigid from a community perspective. It sort of drove them down. A, they felt they were being marched down a line uh, at a predetermined uh, pace. Um, so a very flexible policy for us now, and, and I'll, I'll mention the communities we've got uh, in just a second. Uh, internationally, it, you know, it is really the only game in town for disposal of large complex inventories. There are plenty of other um, uh, options for uh, you know at the lower end of the spectrum near surface disposal there's options being developed deep borehole disposal that could accommodate certain niche products but when you look at our inventory even when you look at the size some of the packages we're, we're talking you know six cubic meter concrete boxes you know 50 tons a piece they're not going down a borehole um, well not with uh, with, uh, with with anything um, that, that we can think of today um, so all, you know, we work very closely with a lot of these uh, international uh, waste management organisations. Uh, Finland uh, is the front runner at the moment. Uh, they've constructed the first part of their facility. Uh, they're doing final commissioning work next year, and then they'll be into operations, and they're dis uh, disposing of uh, Finland's inventory of spent fuel. Um, SKB in Sweden, uh, not too far behind. Uh, the French programme, uh, uh, CGO uh, project uh, near... Um, uh, Bure, uh, they'll probably be in operations towards the end of this decade. Um, Switzerland would be an interesting to watch this year. They're announcing their site. They've gone down a different policy of find the site they want and tell society that's where it's going to be. Uh, and Canada's, again, just coming out of a, a long site selection process. They had a lot of communities volunteer, over 20, 22, I think, uh, and they're getting down to their, their final uh, uh, choice. So we're in good company, um, but as the nation that started um, the atomic age, um, you know, I feel it personally is something that we really should keep this program in focus because uh, it helps all of us. Um, uh, it gives us, uh, I think, of it as giving us the license to operate. If we can close the back end of the fuel cycle with a permanent disposal solution, that terminates the liability, terminates future human uh, activity, then I think we're doing a really good thing. Um, I just wanted to mention this sort of, uh, in terms of the theme of the energy strategy that's just been announced, um, the shift up to an aspiration for 24 gigawatts, how does that affect the GDF program? Uh, it's pretty easy to accommodate it. We're talking about a geological footprint increasing from perhaps five by five kilometers to about six by six kilometers. We already, in the policy that was set in 2014, had 16 gigawatts baked into our program, along with a lot of other items that are still in debate as to whether they uh, represent wastes or not, so things like depleted uranium. So we've all long had uh, a, a pretty uh, large inventory in our sites, and it's very modular. You don't build the GDF, commission it, and turn it on. 
you build the first capabilities you need and then just like a mine, it evolves over the, the next 100 or, or more years. So very flexible as to the number of vaults and disposal uh, uh, facilities that you build um, in, in Agenia. Um, so the answer is 24 gigawatts is you know, uh, no specific challenge for GDF and, and we're at the early part of the design program, so very easy to accommodate uh, that type of change. Um, just to give you some sort of sense of this is real, we've now got four communities uh, in the process, uh, two areas of Copeland in West Cumbria and Allerdale, and then really uh, uh, interesting for us, Steddlethorpe on the East Coast, um, because it's the first non-nuclear community that's kind of started to look at it. Great geology, some challenges over there. But those four communities, we're in a period out till about 2025 now, where we're doing seismic studies, feasibility work, uh, and then we'll bring a, a decision back to Bayes in around uh, late 25, 26, to pick the two front runners that we then take into um, a program of uh, dip, uh, doing all the, uh, the deep borehole drilling, full site characterization, et cetera. Um, sort of the sell on this for communities, um, quite tricky, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, an ex-colleague of mine, he, he's uh, the director of the STEP program, the new fusion uh, program, um, and when they launched their siting process, I think they had a long list of about 50 local authorities and whittled down very quickly to their, uh, their, their recommended five that they're going to look with in terms of feasibility. You know, if there's something in the human psyche that if it's new and shiny and saving the planet and you know delivering power, solving climate change, um, that seems to be attractive. Um, we're trying to get people to see an element of uh, hosting this facility. Uh, not only does it provide economic sense, jobs, you know, some fairly tangible things quite quickly, um, but actually, you know, in, in terms of national infrastructure that has to be ho hosted, um, this is part of the NDA's overall cleanup mission largest environmental cleanup mission um, uh, in the UK. Uh, and so it's a pretty worthwhile thing to be backing to say that you're going to be part of a program that will help us dispose of the nation's waste. Um, just a few. I think I've probably covered most of the, the facts and figures there. Um, it really is about uh, us having the patience to work with the communities. Um, all of the last 40 years has, has taught us that whenever organizations or government try to enforce this into an area, then it doesn't work. And that's not just a UK experience, there's, there's plenty of experience globally. Um, so we really are serious this time that, you know, communities are at the heart of it. And, you know, one of my pleas to the, the whole of the nuclear community, it needs a little bit of strategic patience at times. Um, yeah, as I said, we fired the gun in 76 and people are quibbling over whether I can shorten the timeline by a year or two to get to first waste in place. And actually the important bit is building that trust with the communities, uh, carrying them over the line and really getting them invested uh, in, in, a, uh, in an enterprise that, that they're gonna be proud to host and be part of for a very long time. Look forward to all the questions and, uh, uh, and the debate that we'll have on this one, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. We now come to our final speaker, after which we'll move to Q&A. And I was checking, there are some questions coming in on Slido, but uh, do, put, do start putting your questions up. And upvoting questions that have already been tabled that you very much agree with, which helps us identify the key issues. Now, we're, we're going to hear finally from Professor Paul Monks, who is the Chief Science Advisor at Bayes. He delivers impartial and independent scientific advice to ministers. He is also uh, an academic at University of Leicester where he remains professor in atmospheric chemistry and earth observation science. Paul, it's very good of you to join us this evening. Over to you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, last but uh, certainly hopefully not least, I, I, think, I, I think my job is to kind of virtually repeat everything that's gone before. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully I've got some different pictures uh, that will engage you uh, in that. So really, new nuclear and the UK energy strategy is what we've been going to talk about tonight. I am going to remind you a little bit of why. You know, we do need to achieve net zero by 2050. We do need to decarbonize our economy. We've heard that. We, we, uh, this is just a graph from the CCC that is looking at the ways that we, we can do that. 
We do forget a lot about the top two. We do need to reduce demand, and we do need to increase efficiency in the way that we use energy. And I think we should, we should always start uh, with that. But there are a number of low-carbon solutions out there. We're going to talk a lot about electrification, but the point has been made, and I'm going to make the point again around cogeneration. There's lots of other things that come out of losing nuclear energy that we're going to need in this decarbonised energy system. That low-carbon energy rather than electricity is the key distinction. We're talking about energy here, not just electricity. I think I, I like this graph, you know, uh, which is the daily total energy demand of the UK. And what this looks at is on any given day how much uh, we use in gigawatt hours. Uh, at the bottom there is the, is, is the electricity, you know, about 1,000 gigawatt hours, uh, about 1,500 gigawatt hours. In the middle there is, is fuel. You know, uh, that's the liquid energy that we use every day. And you can see the dip. Uh, as we go into COVID there, as we start to stop using our cars. And if you want to know the challenge of the energy, uh, it's, I don't want to call it a crisis because we're not short of something, but the energy price crisis, I'll call it that, if you will, if that's the, the energy that we use in gas. We use gas to balance our load at the moment. In the peak uh, of something like the beast from the east, that's five terawatt hours in a single day. And that's the energy system that we've got to have for the, for the future. We've got to take that total amount of energy and we've got to produce it in a low carbon way. And that's the challenge that really is in front of us uh, around, around this. We can look at it another way, and this has already been said. On the left hand side here, here's the total UK energy consumption. We, we talk a lot about electricity as the energy that we use, but that's only 17% of what we use. Actually, we use uh, about 40% in transport and 43% in heating. I think Julia made a really, really good point uh, around uh, heat as a commodity. And I think that's going to be an important feature of our, of our future energy system. The point was also made that we're going to have a system, the energy strategy, which we're going to talk about a lot this evening, makes that point. We're going to concentrate a lot on nuclear, but you can't think of the role of nuclear without thinking about what the rest of that system is going to look like. We've got a systems problem here. It's a system that we're trying to solve, and nuclear is part of that systems approach that we're going to need to do. And as the point has been made, the more renewables you put on the system, the greater the intermittency. And, and the quiz question is, you know, on my winter day, how am I going to get my seven terawatt hours of energy? You know, that's the quiz question. You know, without the lights going out, without your heating turning off, and you've got the ability in the future to charge your car. The ability to charge your car. Mm, yeah, transport. You know, we're going to need to double the amount of electricity, approximately in that energy equation that I've just showed you for the future, because we're going to electrify. Electrify is a good way of decarbonizing. So though I've just made the case for energy, we're going to have to double the amount of uh, electricity, and we're going to have to manage. We often, in Bayes, we call the, ga the, ga the gas vampire. You know, we often call it, because it kind of goes up and down. You know, I'm sucking money out of people's pockets at the moment, which is, not, <laughs> which is probably not, not the analogy I probably want to, want to give on this stage, uh, I, I, I'm afraid. So uh, to the energy strategy, uh, and uh, best is known colloquially, um, BEST is not just the kind of thing that was dreamt up overnight. You know, it, it's a sense it kind of built uh, and it has a story. It started off in, in November 2010 as the 10-point as the plan uh, for the Green Industrial Revolution. In October 2021, as part of our COP26 efforts, we produced the, the Net Zero Strategy for the UK. The CCC points out, the, so the Climate Change Committee, points out that it's one of the most comprehensive strategies ever produced by a country. So actually we've embodied that, back to my systems argument here, we've embodied what we're trying to do here uh, as part of, the, of, of building uh, from the net 10-point plan to net zero strategy. But what we really realise, driven by the rush to Ukraine and uh, efforts, is that we need to think a little bit about the ambition and the scale of that ambition, and that was brought together in the British Energy Security Strategy, which really uplifted the ambition that we have, that we've been building on and thinking about and putting together, it, and it was published as a, a, a package of ambitious measures for this secure, clean and affordable uh, energy system. The system argument, nuclear sits in there. I don't really need to repeat this. You know, we're going to get to 24 gigawatts by, by 2050, much more ambitious in the way that we, we build nuclear plants and the role that they have to play. Uh, it, eventually, we... we uh, in, this, in this strategy, we want to go to 25% of our projected energy. And there's very detailed elements in terms of sites and uh, uh, the way that we, uh, the ambition terms of the number uh, produced and permitted 
uh, per year. In order to do that, you've got to change the operating model, uh, and you know, the, uh, uh, it, the strategy puts forward the, the Great British Nuclear as a new body in order to be able to uh, deliver that. But also, we're going to think about the next generation of nuclear as well, uh, beyond, beyond uh, gigawatt and uh, 120 million, the future enabling fund as well. And there are lots of other ambitions uh, in this system uh, that are all going to go on, which are going to drive a, a more rapid decarbonisation of our energy system uh, by 2050 and meet the demands of, of changing energy usage as well. And it covers uh, uh, all sorts of, of different things. You can't just, you're going to have to change the energy system. Uh, Julia talked a little bit about the way that we have to change the, the financial models and the way that we put that together. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to go in. It's not just about building power plants. It's the way that we operate it, the way that we have financial models for it, the way that we uh, then have a network that's able to distribute what is a, a massively different type of system uh, of, the, of the future. Uh, and much of that is, is in that whole system, holistic design, a centralized uh, strategic network plan due out uh, later uh, this year. You probably don't need to, for me to say this. Uh, you, we've kind of been, been talking about this all evening. We've got the gigawatts that, that Julia's talked about. We've talked about uh, SMRs and uh, what Sophie talked about. Uh, beyond that, we talk about AMRs, advanced modular reactors, the next generation really designed to take forward the, the cogeneration that we talked about a lot tonight, designed to deliver that. And also very much at the end, uh, we talked about fusion uh, and the step process. And we are leading the step process and I think we'll announce uh, either later this year or early next year the, the site. We're trying to think about how uh, to get ahead of how you produce commercial uh, fusion energy. That's somewhere uh, in the future. And I think there's a, there's a scale that, that goes through here. And I'm not going to make any judgment this, this evening. I'm not going to sit here and wisely say what is the correct mixture of these sort of technologies, particularly when uh, people have very strong opinions about those sort of things uh, as well. Um, so SMRs, you know, small modular reactors you've heard about. AMRs, really those, use those novel uh, um, uh, fuel systems uh, for cogeneration. We've, we've made very clear that we think that the very high temperature water reactor is the way forward. That's what we've indicated in the Future Nuclear Fund as the Future Nuclear Enabling Fund as the way forward uh, as part of that. Partly for the same arguments that Sophie used around uh, pressurized water reactors, this technology you know, we've got the skills, we've got the supply chain that understands the elements of that. It's just, it's just tweaking it. It's just tweaking it that will take 20 years, but it's just tweaking it that will, that will drive, uh, drive that forward as part of this. I think this cogeneration piece is absolutely critical to this. You know, Julia made the point that 65% of the energy that we, we create in the nuclear, we waste. Heat is a commodity. We're going to decarbonize. We're going to reach that scale. We've got to be more efficient in the way that we use that. We've got to have nuclear as a different part of the system where actually we want to use the base load created actually by the renewables, and we want to use a nuclear to balance that load. We kind of have to invert the logic slightly of the way, of the way that we do that. Uh, so actually, there's lots of ways that we want to do, and we talked about hydrogen production, direct air capture, uh, seawater de desalination. <coughs> there's also all the use of the heat, uh, as well as other things, including making ammonia uh, another, another hydrogen vector uh, for the future as well, which I think will be uh, used a lot in marine uh, as, part, uh, as part of this. So we have a road, uh, and I've, I've, I've done a why build SMRs and why build AMRs, but I think you've probably had enough of that sort of argument uh, for this evening. Uh, they, they, they progress, and I, and I think they show a, a step forward in the thinking. I finally want to come to the point of the role of, of R&D, and this is something that we've been working on in Bayes. This is sort of a systems diagram of the, of the new programs that you might want to think about, but also the mature programs that we have, the sort of fleet that we'll have in the future, and the research and development uh, that, that we're going to need to do that. I think we were going to have to recognize, and I think one of the key challenges, and you really struck at it by the ambition that we've heard from this platform this evening, we're going to need people to do this. We're going to need skilled people to do this. And we're going to need skilled people who know how to do nuclear operations, science, and building. And there's actually you know, jobs for generations there, but there are skills for generations. And we should reflect that, it, that we have lost some of those skills as, as that population has aged, as, as we haven't built and operated at this sort of scale for a while. Uh, so I think we should recognize that as part of it. 
you know, the, the future may be bright, but we've got to make sure we get the people and the skills and the research and development and the understanding that gives the longevity that John talked about in the way that we think around uh, a nuclear program. So to conclude, 2050, where will we be? Uh, most energy will come from renewables. I mean, that's, that's you know, let's, think, let's have a look at that system. You look at in the uh, net zero strategy, you know, it, it, you know, a large amount comes from that. They're intermittent. They're probably going to be the cheapest way. Now, I, I have a view, which maybe we'll get to on, on, on cost of things a little bit later, that we tend to think about the cost of nuclear in the wrong way. We've got to think about the system cost of electricity, not the generation cost of electricity. That one part is more expensive and one part is cheap, but they can't deliver at the same time. You've got to look at the system cost of that power, and you've got to be optimising that system cost. And I think Julia said about that availability question is already beginning to drive that. We spend billions on load balancing per annum. We don't think of that as a primary cost of the electricity system, yet we have to do load balancing the nature of having a system with renewables on, and that has a cost on us. So I think we've got to think a little about, about the levelised costs of the total system. And I think nuclear, for me, offers that trade-off between capacity, which I think will be small, actually, relatively speaking, though we can argue the strategy is 25%, which is get, getting to be quite big, and generation, which is a significant part uh, of that future. So hopefully that kind of lays out, I think, uh, some of the challenges that we face around the energy system and the transition, the systems approach that we've got to take, the, the challenge that BESS really puts down in the, the scale and the magnitude and the speed of that ambition, what we're really going to need to have to deliver that. But actually, you know, there is no harm pushing harder and faster to decarbonise our economy in a world that's going to need it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, I can, I can take Thank you very much. see there's a kind of logic we, we have tried to go through the cycle of on nuclear and even with that hint on, on nuclear fusion from Paul <laughs> at the end and we've gotten better than the joke that it's always 30 years away it's now 28 years away. <laughs> <laughs> that's progress um, so let's go through the questions I'm going to do a couple from Slido and then I'll in case of people who are not operated by Slido we'll also have a mic for you but the, the Slido question that's been upvoted the most is very interesting and I think it, it, we're going to interpret it in a broad sense is it realistic to expect communities to accept SMR reactors uh, nuclear is a challenge even in nuclear communities I'm going to start with Sophie on SMR and the extent to which you're actually going to target nuclear sites already. But then, and not everybody has to comment on every question, but there is a wider issue here, just about the wider acceptability of nuclear, which is what also makes it so slow and whether people are optimistic about that. But, but you first, particularly about SMR, and do you think you're actually going to get to sites that are not currently designated for nuclear? So it's a really interesting point, and clearly nuclear plants can only go where the communities accept them. However, what we do see is that actually where there is a need for that power or a need for, for those jobs, for example, to support an industry, there is a real demand and a real pull for the SMRs to be located. So we talk to communities, not just in the UK, but around the world, and especially where there is an industrial landscape that is powered currently by coal or gas, all they can see in the future is that, that those jobs will be gone and there's nothing to replace them. So actually, we can see in the future industrial hubs growing up around low carbon power. So there's such a demand from industry for low carbon power, whether it be from a large plant, a small plant, anything, or, or even um, uh, uh, solar or wind, actually the industry will come to where that power is. And so communities absolutely are looking for those jobs and for, uh, uh, and for, that, for, for, that, for that longevity of, of, that, uh, of those jobs. And they're actually wanting, uh, we think, SMRs in, in their region. Now, of course, it doesn't apply to everyone, but, but this is something that we see as a pull. The other thing is, obviously, an SMR has less impact in terms of the overall uh, community. So we're talking about having around 500 people on site during construction for a period of around four years. 
and it's all enclosed within a factory. So actually, the day-to-day -day impact on the local community is much lower from, a, from an SMR. Uh, Some uh, people are saying you'll start with four SMRs on that site in Wales. Is that, what, what's, your, wh so what's your top tip? Again, we're a technology vendor. There's no decision yet on, on exactly where the first sites will be. What, what I can say is the same as, as most technology vendors. There are many sites in the UK that are, are, are absolutely suitable for uh, the Rolls-Royce SMR. And we're in discussions with the government and, and others about who, uh, which sites we will deploy at first. I mean, John, do you want to comment on the sort of thing? Because you go through all this issue of public sexuality as well. Yeah, I think I, I, I think this is probably music to Sophie's ears. That, that you know, our evidence is that we've generated a non-nuclear community who's interested in hosting the GDF. Um, we had other interested parties who they afforded confidentiality, um, who we didn't take forward because the geology wasn't right, and they were non-nuclear communities. So I would say, yeah, there is evidence that. Um, I think society is, is, is taking a different view as to what what, uh, what economic activity might support an area going forward. I think they're uh, perhaps a little bit more open-minded. So I think, yes. Do you want to comment on that? Um, well, I'd say that people tend to say that people don't support nuclear, but it, it just isn't really true. I mean, I think the last UGov poll showed, I think, 58% of, of the population sort of actively in favour with, with relatively few actively against. In Finland, where they've just turned on um, mm. an EPR, it's actually 74% in favour, and I think 12% against. I think, uh, I think the people who generally are not in favour of nuclear are really the commentariat. You know, when, when, you, when, you, when you poll people around the stations, it's very popular. Why wouldn't it be? It's quiet. It's a very good employer. It's a huge contributor to the local community. It's pe people, people in nuclear communities like it. And presumably these local heating systems that you're now talking about yeah. add, you'll get a sense of yeah, the direct it will, it will local it benefit. It will, it will embed it. And I mean, I think really the issue, the issue, the issue isn't, I mean, of course, of course, public acceptability is its own issue. But the real issue for, for SMRs is actually the re regulation and it's around, it's around the rules around how close to the centre of the population <laughs> can you put a pressurised water reactor. And I think, there's, I think there's a really interesting inflection point coming up where you've seen in the press that, that you know, maybe the government might like the AGRs, which have been announced as closing down, but have not closed down. That's going to be a really interesting inflection point. It's, it's, it's causing people to think about proportionality. Why are they closing? What's the harm in them closing in comparison with the risk of them staying open? Any comments, Paul? Ministers wrestle with this? Yeah, they do. I mean, the sins of the past are the sins of the future. I think that's what I always uh, ask about this. But I, I've visited a lot of areas in Newcombe. There's a lot of buy-in in those sort of, uh, of, of those sort of communities. I think that the challenge, you know, the, the challenge that we haven't talked about, and, and part of the reason why we're going to license nuclear sites at the moment, is the challenge of security. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's one which has significant costs. So actually one of the reasons to utilise the sites is that they're already set up uh, for that. So it's, it's trying to kind of minimise those sort of costs. Can I make one other mm. comment? Just, just one of the things that always strikes me, we're recruiting lots of people at the moment, um, and, and one of the things that I love hearing is when we get younger people, especially graduates, come, and they say they want to come and join the project, not because it's nuclear, because they want to be involved in green technology and solving the climate change problem. And I love hearing that after yeah. so many years in the industry. They don't think of it as nuclear. They think of it as green yeah. technology. And that is exactly where I think uh, the younger generation are thinking about nuclear. And that's yeah. really positive. I'm going to ask one other question from, from Sligo before coming to, to the room. And because again, this actually, again, begins with SMRs. <laughs> and you're in the thorough line. But it's, again, to the wider application, which is about technical staff and training. But the specific question is whether you actually need, as, as you're going to need several SMRs to achieve the same output as, a, as one large <laughs> nuclear plant, if you aggregate all that, are more technical staff needed for SMRs? And does this make SMRs more costly? Will they be trained in time? But again, let's pick up on the, on the wider issue that's been raised of our capacity to train the people we need. So, so again, uh, we... we uh, the number of staff that we need to operate the plant is commensurate. It's proportional to, uh, I suppose, the number of staff at a, a large plant. Um, again, there's a certain base load of staff that you would need, depending on the fleet. So you need your technical authority. You need um, 
but obviously it only has the safety and various other things. So, so it's proportionate to the number of staff. What, what matters is how, how effectively and efficiently you can operate that uh, unit. So 95% availability, producing electricity at a levelized cost of electricity or hydrogen at a levelized cost of, of hydrogen that is affordable means that you've got an efficient operation. In terms of training the staff, absolutely we need the period of time to train the staff, but obviously we have the time to be able to train the staff. Now, if we're talking about 20, obviously 24 gigawatts, we're talking about quite a large training program. And that won't just be small, that'll be large as well. So we do need to increase the number of people who are working in this, in, in our industry and the number of skills that we have coming through. But we've obviously got mm. time to plan for that and, and that's what we're doing. And Paul, um, just bring us up to date where the government is on this. It's a strand in their thinking. Um, where, what, what kind of training initiatives are there for a growing nuclear capability? So the General Across Net Zero is the Green Jobs Task Force, which is thinking about the jobs that we need for the net zero transition and recognising that actually the, the skill base is going to change and, and uh, you know, the ability of hydrogen boilers versus gas boilers, heat pumps, etc. So the, the thinking is there. Um, as part of the work that I showed you on the R&D side, we're ramping up very much the sort of thinking that we're going to need in order to deliver the nuclear skills that are going to be for the R&D base. I think Julia might have an interesting perspective. I'm not just going to hand it off uh, 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 on this because actually one, one of the questions is the skilled workforces that have been built up around the, the Hinkley uh, and Sizewell uh, you know, will, will then flow out, I think, into, into this market uh, over the next few years. So though we're not starting from a, uh, an absolutely low baseline, absolutely zero baseline uh, on this as well because of, because of the, uh, the, the, the large number of people working in the supply chain currently, I think they're going to get pulled quite heavily over the next few years. Uh, but that, that, that's not a bad thing because these are high-skilled, high-wage jobs. Yeah, do you want to come on? Well, I think that you know, if you look at the nuclear industry today, the operate the civil nuclear industry consists of the EGF power stations, which Paul showed on his map, plus the people working at Hinkley. I mean, that that, that is that's where the heritage of British energy now is. It's in the surviving operating AGRs, Sizewell B and Hinkley Point C. Those are the only operating nuclear power stations in the UK, and they will be the only operating power stations in the UK for the next years until BP turns on in 2027. So I, th I think something for the government to really think about is is, um, is ensuring cooperation. You know, the nuclear industry tends to be very cooperative, but but the government has tended, I don't mean this government in particular, governments have tended to, I think, rather overstate the benefits of competition and understate the benefits of collaboration. To get the number of people you need for to staff Hinkley, Sizewell, and SMR programme, you need the existing nuclear industry to collaborate with new entrants. And, and if you promote too much competition, that's going to make life very difficult. So people are inclined yeah. to cooperate, people want to cooperate, people want the best for the UK. But you do need a framework within which that makes sense. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you have any Yeah, I, 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 I mean, and this really comes more from my 30 year background operating nuclear powered submarines <laughs> than, than it does uh, from the GDF. But, you know, there's, there's, there's no doubt that the UK nuclear capability peaked at the back end of the 20th century. Um, I did a Wikipedia tally up. We've delivered 13 and a half gigawatts since the dawn of the atomic age. We now want to move on with another 24. Um, a lot of the underlying capabilities in the technologies, materials, material processing, post irradiation examination, facilities like National Nuclear Laboratory, um, there undoubtedly needs to be a very competent strategy to generate all of the underlying people. Um, I always remember back that when NASA went for the space program, they had 250,000 engineers on that program. So when we talk about needing to generate, um, you know, it's really starting back in the education train, looking at our university sector, looking at all of the support sector. So it, there has to be a, something matched to this strategy to, to ramp us back to where we were at the end of the last century, not where we are at the moment. And when you look at the plans and the... And Paul, you are also active still in the world of universities as well. Are you confident that, it, in the crudest sense, the sums add up? The flow of people doing uh, the courses most relevant for nuclear engineering are going to be coming on stream when we need them? No, I'm not confident. I'm, I'm going to be honest. You know, I'm not. I mean, I, I, think, I think there is a sea change making place. I mean, I, I, 
I, I don't call nuclear green. I, I, I chair one of the green taxonomy groups, so... Um, I think you should go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, depend, yeah, so I, I'm going I'm to put myself out of that one quite quickly <laughs> uh, and go, no, I, th I think we're going to have to increase the ambition. I, 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 I don't think we should delude ourselves that we're in, in the right place. It's, it's exactly as, as John said, we, we, we had a peak and we've declined from it, and we're going to have to accelerate and, and build that skill space quite rapidly. And you, I mean, you could you could look at it, and if you look at the big picture in the university sector, the number of civil engineering courses that have clo closed over recent years, the number of electrical engineers that we're now short of as a, as a country. So I, actually, this will be a great stimulus, I think, to, to those subjects. Yeah. Uh, but there is going to be a supply and demand yeah. problem and, and timescale problem. And I, and I don't think we should. I can't really sit yeah. here with a, with a good heart and say, "Oh yes, Dave, it's going to be yeah. fine." You know. <laughs> Right. And I think it's also things like high-end welding. We haven't mm. trained welders in the UK yeah. for years. Why haven't we? We haven't trained welders because we've cut funding for further education colleges and they couldn't afford to run welding courses. So we don't have high-end welders. To get high-end welding at Hinkley, we've had to open welding academies, fund welding academies, to train a whole new generation of British welders. So it, it isn't just the nuclear engineers. It, it's high-end construction yeah. skills. Yeah. yeah. Those TWI, well, they used yeah. to be called the Welding yeah. Institute. Yeah. 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 Some of them, but I agree. Yeah. Well, Okay, now, those were the, some, the most popular Sligo questions. Now, let's go around the room, and if you could give your name and organisation as well, please, when you speak. I'll, I have got several. David Monge. Yes. Um, Walter, Walter, Bodmer. Bodmer. Uh, Walter Bodmer from Oxford University. I'm not an engineer, um, but I've been interested in this subject. And I spent uh, six years as chairman of the NRPB, uh, which had a major interest in... in public response to the dangers not only of nuclear energy, but of uh, mobile phones attached to you earlier, and of, of power lines and things like that. And I'm, I'm a little surprised at the confidence that you're dealing uh, with the public in this, in this respect. I think there are two different aspects, as I would understand it, coming entirely new. One is just what the local attitude is, which might be more positive if there are more jobs there and but the other is what the overall attitude of the public as a whole is. And I think that's extremely important to keep that in mind and to have much more explanation of the value of nuclear energy and what it can give and, mm -hmm. and not uh, and getting rid of this totally inappropriate fear uh, of, of the danger of it. And I would just ask your opinions on that and say I think there's a lot needed to be done there Otherwise, you'll suddenly find there's a huge opposition. Nothing to do with where you're wanting to put a plant. Right, very salutary point. Let's collect some more interventions, then go through them in the group. Yes, the gentleman there. Uh, uh, this one's for uh, Julia, just to give Sophie a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, um, you kindly went through a number sorry, of... Sorry, could you give your name? Oh, sorry, Mark, Mark Pettison, um, Director of Warwick Energy, uh, the, the UK's leading independent offshore wind developer. I'm pro-nuclear under the right circumstances. The, my, 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 my big concern uh, is the recent change to the, or the proposed change to the regulated asset base funding. Um, you went through a number of the concerns, Julia. The big one that I think you missed out was the technology risk. Um, we can argue whether Hinkley's late or not, but Flammerville certainly is, and I'm not sure the finished plants are operating yet. So, you know, the UK consumer is about to start paying for a technology that may never deliver a single kilowatt hour onto the grid because you haven't got a proven technology. Could you? I know you're not an I know you're not an engineer, but um, if you could provide any reassurance on that, that would be very useful. Um, let's go back to a couple more. That's a, a bold challenge. And let's, there's a couple more in that corner. We'll get those. Yeah. Good evening, Martin for University of Birmingham. Um, so my question is around the fuel cycle. So uh, we are in an age of an open fuel cycle. Uh, several decades ago, we had the capacity around a closed fuel cycle. So we had a MOX plant, we had a reprocessing <coughs> plant, we had a fast reactor program. Is, is the open cycle, given that uranium is a finite resource, Maybe it's got another 100 years or so to run. Is, is really an open cycle the right approach? So do we have the right UK strategy around the fuel cycle? 
Right, very interesting. And then, yes, in the corner. Hi, Dan, Dan Garbutt. Um, the uh, rolling program of decommissioning uh, technical strategy lead for Magnox, part of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Uh, so it's a bit of a question to the, the, the panel, the sort of growing focus on sustainability and obviously the, the, the fact that nuclear may play um, quite uh, an important role in that is, is front and centre at the moment. So it's clear from um, the sustainability challenges that we face as a country and as a planet, they're not sector specific. Um, so, you know, how does the panel see uh, collaboration outside of the nuclear family on some of those shared challenges that we have to deliver the projects, such as, um, I think, Sophie, you mentioned the capabilities across your supply chain, and also as well, um, you know, with the, with, with, with the supply chain at EDF. Um, you know, how important are those relationships, and, and what do we see? Uh, how do we improve bringing that, uh, those relationships to the fore to deliver some of the complex challenges of nuclear? Right, that's a great range of questions. <laughs> You, and everybody doesn't have to answer every question, but perhaps Julia, you might engage with the question whether or not you've got the technology that's going to work or not. <laughs> so, um, around the world, there are literally no reactors which have not turned on for purely technical reasons. So, there are reactors which have not turned on for because they've been because of the political reasons, because economics have shifted against them, because the bill's not gone well and the economics have shifted such that people have stopped. There are no reactors which have not turned on. And that, that's, an, that's an agreed position with government and it's the consensus report. So what's an EPR? An EPR is a pressurised water reactor of which there are hundreds around the world and they have an average 91% availability. So they're a very well-known technology. Does the EPR work? Yes, the EPR works. So in Finland, yes, it's late, but it, it's, it's on. It's going to provide about 14% of Finland's electricity. It's branded as being Finland's greatest climate act. Um, as, I, as I said before, Finland has currently got 74% public favourability to nuclear based on this having turned on, giving them energy security against Russia. In Taishan, the, the two plants were actually top rated by the World Nuclear WANO, like the World Association of Nuclear Operators. They do have a problem with the fuel design. It's not that uncommon to have a problem with fuel design at the start of a reactor build. Those two plants will come back on there. It'd be absolutely fantastic putting out vast quantities of low-carbon electricity in China, and we should be very glad that they're there, because otherwise that, that power would be replaced by coal and gas. Flamville 3 is not a success story. I'm not purporting to defend Flamville 3. Um, it was the prototype. Many things have gone wrong. It's well understood what's gone wrong, and Kingsley benefits from it. And if you look at, you know, around the world, P a PWR versus a, a UK EPR adapted to UK design, I'd basically use the analogy of a, of a car. The PWR is like the engine. It's basically the same, or pretty much whatever design you're, you're using, if it's a pressurized water reactor. And the UK, the UK adaptations have changed the body. As, you know, we've changed the steering wheel to the other side. We've just got a different braking system. And you know, we're meeting the requirements of the UK regulator. But it's a very, very well understood technology of which they do all the work. Right. Um. Do you want to comment? I mean, you know, this, uh, uh, I know, let's move along because that was a very fair answer. Sophie, why don't you pick up perhaps, perhaps the fuel cycle question and also this issue about capabilities across the wider supply chain? Yeah, yeah, can do. So certainly in terms of the fuel cycle, totally agree with you. Um, in terms of actually wouldn't it be a great thing um, to have a closed fuel cycle? I, I, I agree. However, at this point in time... Um, from a technology perspective and from an economic perspective, it's not necessarily a sensible thing for us to start to introduce when we're trying to uh, deploy a vast number of reactors. What we need to do at this stage is have low risk in terms of licensing and operation. And the way to do that is to use technology that we already know exists, as Julia said, pressurized water reactor technology and fuel that we already know is manufacturable um, operators are used to using and actually we can uh, uh, manage with the waste afterwards. So certainly in terms of our technology roadmap, we're looking at how we might use recycled fuels, other forms of fuels, accident tolerant fuel, all of those types of fuels. And as they're developed and their technology readiness level goes up to a, a point at which it's economically sensible for us to introduce them into the cycle, 
certainly we're looking to, to do that, and I, I, I'm pretty certain that uh, EDF are doing exactly the same and other, uh, and other vendors as well. So we're all looking for this, but actually we have to balance what, what is right from a technology perspective with what's right from an economic perspective and, and from a risk perspective in terms of introducing those into the cycle. So, yeah, absolutely brilliant for the future. We're keeping our eyes watching all of those, um, but we have to use what's available today to be able to make an economic solution. And then just in terms of pulling in capabilities mm. for others, absolutely. Nuclear is not a special industry. There is a little bit of the, of the nuclear plant that is nuclear. The majority of the, of the power station is a power station. Um, the majority of construction is construction with a little bit of nuclear added on. Why on earth would we not look at other mm. industries and other sectors? So we've been working very heavily with shipbuilders. Shipbuilders are some of the, the have some of the best experience of modularization of any industry. Why wouldn't we look at shipbuilding? Why wouldn't we look at other sectors? The uh, INC system that we're looking at comes from aerospace. Oh my, and, and it's also used in some of our defense applications. Why wouldn't we use a system that's already qualified for some of the harshest environments in the world <laughs> that you can, you can put an INC system in and just use it in nuclear? That's a much lower, lower risk. So, so actually, absolutely, it's really important that we don't treat nuclear as special, um, except where nuclear needs to be treated as special, because otherwise we just int in introduce risk, introduce cost, and we're not getting a good economic solution. So absolutely, 100%. John? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. Um, so there are significant quantities of material that are not yet deemed waste, but we're planning they may go to a GDF. So I'm talking about the significant inventory of unprocessed spent fuel, the 150 tonnes of plutonium that we have in this country, and probably the biggest part is the 150,000 tonnes of depleted natural low enriched uranium, all of which could go into a closed cycle and fast breeder reactors. Um, really all we're doing in terms of managing this problem, all of that inventory I've talked about is not designated to go to a GDF until at least 2080 and beyond. So really, my, my I think we've got a lot of water to flow under the bridge before that. Um, how is the planet dealing with the climate crisis? What is our is, you know, real landscape for nuclear over the next 60? Will we end, uh, end up in a fast breeder program? We're not disposing of those materials early on. So they remain available um, should there be a, a change into uh, a closed cycle. Yeah fast breeders, and that seems like a common sense thing to do for me. Yeah. Julia? Yeah, very well, interesting. Well, there are, there are people who, who, who are bringing forward those designs. I'm a non-executive director. I'm not here to, to bring a plug, but the, the, the an Italian company called Nucleo, which wants to do exactly what John's saying, which is to turn plutonium. They, they, they want the UK to reintroduce MOX, and they're actually, as it happens, self-funding because they've raised a lot of money. People find their ideas exciting, the way that they find solutions exciting. I mean, as Sophie said, and as John said, we've got to get on with what we can build today. But, but absolutely, um, you know, they're very, very keen to um, uh, make sure, that, as John said, the plutonium the remains option, available yeah. for mm -hmm. the auction. And they're very keen to also, as Sophie said, get hold of the site of Shannon and, <laughs> um, and, um, and get going. When we look at comparat UK's comparative advantage across a whole range of technologies and sectors, we sometimes realise that by virtue of being there first and they're having a lot, thereby having a lot of old stuff, paradoxically, that creates some distinctive comparative advantages. Yeah. So, for example, nuclear decommissioning services are a very good export industry for us because we have wrestled with how you decommission old nuclear plants. And the, so being a leader, and I genuinely don't quite know how much the nuclear decommissioning authorities pay the industry, being a leader you know, both decommissioning and reusing stuff left over from older, dirtier processes yeah. is a good thing to focus on. Do you think we're taking enough of that opportunity? Um, I think it's, uh, uh, NDA is a key strand. I mean, uh, NDA is an enterprise which includes cellar field magnox, et cetera. It, it costs the nation about three and a quarter billion pounds a year. Sure. Um, we've developed uh, immense skills in that enterprise wrestling with some very difficult challenges in you know, places like Dunray and Sellafield, it, it's absolutely on the radar as to how we can capitalize on that and market those skills more widely around the world. Because we have probably one of the leading decommissioning industries um, on the planet. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, it's hard work to figure out how to do some of this stuff, particularly with the older facilities. You know, 
all of the new plants being edged day to day are being designed and built utterly with decommissioning at the front of people's thoughts. That wasn't the case uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, etc. So some of the things that were put together were not really uh, uh, designed for decommissioning. So those challenges have really kind of got us into a, a cutting edge space where we're pretty good at doing it now. David, I could just add, I mean, it goes further than that as well. You know, it, it's using the novel materials that we have to make novel radionuclides that we're using, radionuclides that we're using in the medical radioisotopes area. So actually, NDA has done some great research you know, on, on how to convert that waste into, into other things as well, while, while they're trying to turn it into more passive ways so you don't have to don't have to stores it. But, you know, it's still you know a large problem again. You know, but uh, there there are many good things that come out of the out of the, you know, out of the science and the engineering that we're working in the, in the nuclear disposal industry. But I, I think the point that John made that that you know we now design reactors to take them apart. You know, we're world leaders in robotics technology way yeah. we use robotics, you know, uh, uh, for this. So th it is a new, it's not, it isn't, I don't want to call it a new industry, but you, you can't judge it by, by, solely by its past. Yeah. A, a final set of questions from the room, because we are getting towards the end of our time. Yes, over there and then here, yes. Oh, sorry, there's two over there. Yeah, we get, we'll get them all in if they're brief, and we will then have... Tony them. Rolston, University of Cambridge. Uh, disclaimer, I am a nuclear engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, first statement, uh, we can get very enthusiastic about nuclear among friends here. Today, nuclear has a cost problem. And I want to ask a question about that. There are some ways of dealing with it, and Lord Burnett's mentioned, in 1975, the President of France signed a decree. Fifteen years later, they built 50 yeah. uh, PWRs, uh, and a pr the program approach is perhaps the answer. Well, it's a large reactor or a small reactor. But I wanted to ask a question to Julia. She gave the impression, she gave, I would like to clarify the point about nuclear as part of the mix with renewables. And I just clarified that it doesn't mean that nuclear can be on the grid even if it's more expensive than the whole, whole, whole system cost of renewables. I, I just want to clear that we are talking about onions and onions, not onions and apples, that nuclear will only be on the grid if it's cost competitive, taking everything into account. Let's just collect them a couple more. Yes, and so I think there was another question around. Oh, yes, right. Sorry, Nick. Right, yes, certainly. Hello, I'm uh, Patrick McHugh, a member of the foundation uh, and also a nuclear engineer. I began my career in France working on the nuclear program in the 1970s. Um, my question is, I think, very critical. I'm a resident of Anglesey, where Wilfer yeah. is. <laughs> that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Um, great place. Yeah. I've got a great challenge for you. It's not about the, the local community is very keen. We heard about the burying waste and how the community saw perspective to get an income in the community. That's why Anglesey is interested in, in doing it. The problem they have is there is not a competence in the, on the island to accept the technology which is coming to them. It's just uh, someone's going to give us some money. We have to build a local competence that will then draw the people, us in. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we might do that. Right. Then there was another question, up, I think, in the fire, and then we'll move across. Yes, there's a... Yeah. Hi, uh, Mark Jacob, DEFRA. Um, many of the panel made reference to the potential for climate change mitigation from uh, the new nuclear. But one consideration I've... One consideration I've not seen um, mentioned beyond climate change mitigation is the matter of climate change adaptation. So much of this discussion about new nuclear is talking about decadal, even century lifespans. But I've seen with many existing plants globally, the coolant systems can't deal with the reality of a warming climate. So to what extent and over what time frames has that been built into the calculations? Right. right. Yeah. Are we allowing for the effects of climate change? And I think there was, yes, question here. Oh, th thank you. Um, it's Peter Marsh of the Made Here Now. <coughs> it's another question really on the disposal issue of the waste. Um, I mean, it seems to me, as a dispassionate observer really, no matter how hard you sell nuclear power, you're always going to come back to this issue that you are trying to create a, an industry that just can't live without producing huge quantities of some of the most 
dangerous material you could ever visualize. Now, given that you've got some disposal ideas, um, just how many of these disposal devices is to John do you actually need? I mean, could you get by with just these three communities who used to nuclear power and the disposal elements of it in Cumberland, or Cumbria, I should say? Um, I mean, or, or do you need loads of them? Um, I mean, could, could you just, uh, if you like, persuade or bribe or whatever the communities there to accept these and just live with that, perhaps burying deeper and deeper into the earth to get rid of this stuff? Or do you really need loads of them dotted around the country? Right, the disposal. And I'm going to take the liberty of adding <coughs> one other question, which partly prompted by disposals, because there are some nuclear technologies that don't have a disposal problem, a nuclear fusion. And of course, in the S there is a case for SMRs leading on to very advanced nuclear reactors. I don't understand the science and engineering, but the suggestion is you actually have a convergence in some of the work you do on SMRs and then more advanced reactors are themselves crucial for nuclear fusion. And so does anybody on the panel think we might get to nuclear fusion before 2050 and see the technologies they're working on today as helping to make that possible? I'd like to throw that in. But Sophie, why don't we start with you? On, on fusion? Well, on, on fusion, but also pick up on one or two. That so I think the issue about whether you're going to get your SMRs yeah, at Anglesey yeah, yeah. would be a good one. So fusion, if I start with fusion, again, we have worked with the fusion program, absolutely brilliant program. I think the really interesting thing from our perspective is about the commercialization. So again, the fusion reactor is just a kettle in the middle, in the same way that a fission reactor is just a kettle in the, in the middle. The question is, how do you develop the rest of the power station around it? And that's one of the areas of real interest in terms of actually, if we come up with an economic solution to delivering a power station, whether it be the kettle in the middle is a PWR or a fusion plant or whatever, is that a technology that the UK, that capability that the UK then has that it can apply to multiple different plants. So, so that's, that's what I would say about fusion. I, I don't <coughs> want to comment on the, the, when the actual fusion reactor will be ready. Um, although I know they're making great progress. So in that's 28 the, years' time, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, just in terms of Anglesey, I think, again, you're, you're absolutely right. One of the key things is, is about the skills for the plant. Um, one of the advantages of manufacturing a plant in the way that we're talking about for SMRs or our particular type of SMR is most of the skills that are needed for the, manufacture, for the, for the development of that plant are actually in the factories. <coughs> and the factories don't move. So wherever, wherever we put the factories, that's where we're going to have the skills really building up for decades. Decades of, of knowledge and capability built up in those communities around the factories. And then we take the product from those factories and we deploy it uh, in different parts of the world. So we're not talking, if we hopefully get the opportunity to build plants at Anglesey, we're not talking about needing lots and lots of people in that one location to be to build up those skills what we of course will need is we'll need a smaller number of people as i said maximum 500 on site for a period of about four years we'll need those people for that short length of time and of course we'll need the operator capability which is around 300 ish people operator capability including the technical authority and various other things so so we will need those skills that will need to be built up over the time and also obviously we'll need to develop the skills of an operator because the UK UK at the moment doesn't have a state utility in the way that some other countries do so we we definitely need to to, to have that now that could be EDF it could be others obviously one of our shareholders is Constellation who is an existing operator so so again there are certain skills we need to build up but because we have a factory based <laughs> approach it means those skills can stay put for generations, and, and, that, and that's an advantage. David, can, can, I, can I come in on fusion? Right, yeah. yeah. Well, we want to stay on the fusion for a second. I, I, I don't want to be accused of sort of being kind of pie in the sky, but you know, it is actually a real UK success story. Yeah. It is something that we invest you know, at JET and Cullum and yeah. UKAA, something significantly. We talk often about doing moonshots. Actually, we are doing moonshots for fusion in the UK. Actually, companies are now coming into the UK because they recognise 
that it's the place to do fusion commercialization, so Slight Fusion, General Fusion, all move to the UK because it's the place to do it. So actually, we have a success yeah. story on our hands yeah. uh, uh, around this uh, the, the, that we, we play down. Now, we all do the 28 years till fusion joke because I think we should be cautious about playing that technology into the mix. It's fair to the gentleman that said earlier about, you know, we, we've got to have some sort of yeah. proof of that working. But I think we should recognise yeah. that we have a, a really good story around fusion. Yes, it's dr driven out of science. Yes, it's driven out of robotics. But yes, also, it's driven about driving commercial inward investment into the UK as well. And the STEP programme, I mean, when, when somebody first said to me, we're going to build a, a, a first fusion station by 2035, I said, what? That's a mad <laughs> idea. But actually, when you think about it, it it's exactly what Sophie said. You've got to get all the rest of the stuff mm -hmm. to work. So actually, I think it is a story that we should yes. be proud of, and, and though, we, though cautious. Thank you very much. I'm pleased you said that. I agree. I think 2035 is what we should spend our youth on. Mm -hmm. I think it's a serious question. Um, John, do you want to comment particularly on that issue from uh, Peter Marsh about disposal? Yes, and, and can I also just touch on the question mm. from the gentleman from DEFRA um, in terms of are we baking in future climate changes to our designs? Absolutely. Mm. You saw from my slides, a lot of our places we're looking at coastal areas as with nuclear power stations. So yeah, we're, we're looking out um, uh, you know, several hundred years, worst case flooding, what do we have to do to build facilities? I'd also sort of just like to add that we're looking at the GDF from a, a real tough lens on sustainability. We could be lazy and just claim credit for what well, we shut down carbon generating activity elsewhere in terms of storage, but we're pretty determined. You know, we think our license to operate in the time we'll be building will be reliant on a pretty stellar demonstration that we're building low carbon infrastructure, which touches to the question from Dan Garbutt. So, low carbon cement, steel, etc., fundamental in terms of building infrastructure in that time um, uh, in, a, in a, 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 a low carbon way. Uh, in terms of the site itself, um, and the communities working with, we are down selecting to one site to develop. That one, that one site um, using a block of geology, six by six kilometers, that'll probably last this country, certainly through the whole of this century and uh, the, the 20th century waste. Um, so in around 2200, someone might be thinking about where's site two for the next GDF, but uh, it, we don't need a lot of sites. You're right, it's dangerous waste, but there isn't that much of it when you get into the, the geological space to dispose of. Well, it prompted a late intervention. Sorry. Nigel, yeah. So, Mike, yes, you're right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nigel Wilson. I'm the Chief Executive of League in General, and um, I'm probably the, the, less well in, the least well-informed person in the room on this particular topic. Um, but I, what I can say is that, you know, we've been pretty, pretty big investors in offshore wind, onshore wind, in solar, in ground source heating, air source heating. We've also helped to finance the, the nuclear fusion program here in the, uh, the UK. And we're definitely in the 2035, not the 2050 box. I think they've got a network effect. Um, the network effect that they've got is very different from the two areas that you were working on, where everybody's cooperating across the world in a very constructive way and accelerating. And we had that network effect in solar. You know, if you read uh, the work that CERN and others did in a bygone era, the, the, the forecasting errors were, were huge on the wrong side, slipping down much, much quicker than anybody expected in this. And I think that, again, is a, is a massive network effect. I think there's a lot of work to do in this area. We'd love to figure out how we can get involved in financing. But at the moment, we're not financing either SMRs or on, on, on the nuclear plants. And the EDF are our partners in Podpoint, which is mm -hmm. our liquid vehicle charging uh, b b business. And so... Um, somehow th these two industries have to appeal much more to the financing community. And as, as I said to David, I, I'm probably the only person in the room who has, has a lot of money to invest in these <laughs> sorts of acti acti <laughs> activities. That's why I hate revealing myself, <laughs> but since I know David so well around this. And I think the, po the point that Paul made is a really good one. You know, there's new generation technologies and the UK is getting a second bite to invest in so many areas right now because our science and technologies have been infinitely over here, not just in Oxford and Cambridge, but in many other universities, Birmingham, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's super exciting because our universities are accelerating their capability, yeah. and that's allowing us to have these huge investment opportunities. And we have to decide, referring to my own firm there, where we invest big. 
in these in, in these different areas, and so have a proper dialogue with all of the experts uh, in the, in the in the industry. So I don't really have a question other than how do we interface more with with you and because you know what I find hard is that you know are we describing the situational analysis correctly, and so our perception would, of what you've described as a situational analysis is different from the one we have. You know. We, we are great friends with EDF, but when you look at the success they've had on their programs, you know, it's been the finished one was supposed to be finished in 2009, it's four times over budget. You know, when we're investing pension money for people, we find that pretty difficult as a proposition to invest in, because we need some greater degree of certainty on what the, the outcome is of, 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 of that. It's, you know, similarly, you know, offshore wind has proven itself to be brilliant. I mean, the UK is very lucky, they've got very shallow water with very predictable wind. So it's, in terms of a competitive, globally competitive advantage, that's fantastic. And the size and the scale of the, of the facilities and the decrease in cost you get, which is exponential in that te technology, is just, just amazing. And so I think there's a very big picture, where do we want to invest in? Not just in this industry, but in many other industries as well. And it's great when you get this community of incredible knowledge and how do we get the the network effect into both you know, the two nuclear, nuclear options of which are on, on, on in offer here. Uh, because we, we would have a different pitch from Westinghouse. You know, uh, and so if Westinghouse were here, they would have a... a well, that topic. is a very encouraging intervention, Nigel. You're always welcome to FST <laughs> meetings. <laughs> and it's great. And it, it's actually, it's a very fair challenge, actually, for Julia. There's one person who hasn't come in this final round. Because also you were asked earlier on as well, there was a question really for you about cost. Uh, which said there's the wide challenge of making nuclear an investable proposition. Yeah. A final word to you. Well, it's great to have Nigel in the room for this. <laughs> so turning first to cost. So I mean, people who, people in the room won't follow nuclear news as closely as I do, but you'll have seen that yesterday the government published its reasons for why is it going to why is it minded subject to consultation to give a regulated asset based license to Sizewell, and it's and it's because as I said, it brings down household bills even though it is, as a generating unit, a more expensive unit than wind. So why does it bring down household bills? And the level of understanding of household electricity bills is really amazingly low, and I've, I've had to go and talk to the BBC's energy correspondent about you know, wh what's a bill made up of. Well, it's made up of generation. Yes, we have more expensive generation. We are more expensive to generate than offshore wind. It's made up of transmission. It's a lot cheaper to transmit our electricity because it's onshore. Distribution, probably pretty neutral, but actually not completely neutral, but it, that's, not a, that's not a swing factor. Balancing. That's a massive, massive tax. I think, I can't remember what the figure is, but, but, but constraint payments, so payments to wind farms, because the grid didn't want their electricity, reached some very, very high figure, which Paul probably doesn't want to confirm. Very high figure. And they're going to have to change the constraint system. And when they change the constraint system, that will put up the cost of wind electricity because it won't be being paid on days when it could have generated because it was windy, but it didn't. That's not, that's not to criticise the offshore industry. It's a huge success. It's great. But it's to explain why does your household bill go down if you build for nuclear, even though the nuclear electricity power station is obviously more expensive to build than an offshore wind farm. And so if, if our overall aim as good citizens is to bring down low carbon electricity and pricing and household bills, you have to look at it systemically, as Paul said. The, the fact is that the government will go ahead with Sizewell C because it will bring down people's electricity bills, even if it's expensive to build. So, that, and, and then, and then you know, why, why else would it? Well, it's because it can put out heat, because it will contribute to making a, electrolysis much more efficient, because it's a good thing to have continuous electricity. We have, this, as I said, enormous um, UK content of through life of 90% and because we um, are like a jobs factory. So we, we retrain people, we have 1,500 apprentices, we employ people who come from hard to access work background. So it's a very good social value project and it will have life cycle carbon emissions of five and a half grams, which is roughly half the level attributed by the IPCC to wind. So those are all the reasons to do it, but primarily because it brings down bills while giving you electricity. Why is it investable under the Bradford Law? 
So the first, I think what I say now is that we couldn't have a, a RAF model. We couldn't be awarded a RAF licence if the government didn't have confidence that having built Hinkley Unit 1 and showing the progress on Hinkley Unit 2, Sarpol would show um, equivalent productivity benefits as between 1 and 2, and that therefore they can be confident as to the range within which it will come out. And from an investment point of view, it will have investment-grade debt, so that will have the risk characteristics that participate in investment-grade debt. And in terms of the equity, what the RAV model produces is a capped upside and a capped downside. So the equity will get a return within a range. It will be heavily incentivised to bring it in on time and on budget, but there will be no question that anybody imagines equity will invest if there's any risk at all of losing their shirt. This is designed for low-cost pension fund investment to create a virtuous circle of pension fund money, funds, apprenticeships, jobs, and that produces a stable CPI link and extremely predictable, very long-term return. So it's being designed for investment, and um, and you know we, we obviously wouldn't have got this far if this wasn't likely to produce going to produce investment grade debt and a bounded equity return. Excellent. I think we can sense there may be a conversation <laughs> starting <laughs> as we observe. That was a, uh, 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 an excellent answer. Um, thank you all very much to our panellists for a really lively discussion and thank you to all your participation and your questions. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. <laughs>